we, um, before I get going, I just want to acknowledge that we have some very special guests here this morning. Um, two of my three favorite people on planet Earth are here. Uh, actually, all three of my three favorite, two are guests. One is always here, Carmen, but my mom and dad are here in the back row. And there, there's another couple that I have um, admired and looked up to and become friends with for more than 20 years. And uh, that's John and Thelma Oldenberger, and they're also here this morning. And um, I know there's other guests, Ben, and it's great to see you all. And I'm, I'm really excited about this morning because uh, we're, in, we're in a subject that is really exciting. We're talking about spiritual gifts. And um, however, as you know, Tony didn't preach what he was supposed to preach when he preached on spiritual gifts. And then Steve followed up by not preaching what he was supposed to preach. When he preached on spiritual gifts, I'm not going to preach what I was supposed to preach. Uh, but I am going to talk about spiritual gifts this morning. And, uh, but before I get started, I, I had something that was, that was just on my heart. And I think that this happens not just this Sunday. I think this happens all the time. And I think what happens is, you know, the Bible says that we have an adversary, the devil, who prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he, may dis- whom he might devour. And the Bible calls him the accuser. Quiet back there. Um, that was Tony. Um, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And he never stops accusing us. He's... He's always attacking us. He's attacking our character. He's attacking our relationship with God. He's bringing questions. He's bringing us into doubt. And then when we get ready to come to church, it seems like he's got some extra special tricks that he saves for Sunday morning. And, you know, that happens to be the time that we just say that thing to our spouse that, you know, hurts them or we wish we didn't say or we get in a fight or... The kids seem to be all riled up, and we end up frequently coming into church already feeling less than, and feeling unclean, and feeling unworthy, and feeling like there's something wrong with us, and everybody else is more spiritual than I am, and we try to sing these songs, and our mind is thinking about lunch, or it's thinking about the game. Am am I anybody? And so, what I really wanted to do before we get started this morning is I want to tell you that all of those thoughts, all of those feelings of unworthiness and you're not good enough and you're not smart enough, you don't read the Bible enough, you don't pray enough, you don't do this enough and don't that enough, you sin too much, all of that stuff, every bit of that are absolute, utter, despicable, horrible, wicked, disgusting lies from the father of lies that wants to drag you down and make you feel less than who you really are. Because who you really are are a son or daughter of the living God. And you don't even have to, did you know you never have to confess another sin for the rest of your life? That's a fact. That's a truth. Our sins are forgiven. The stuff I haven't even pulled yet has already been forgiven because of Jesus. I'm not forgiven because I have to try to remember the last rotten thing I did. I'm forgiven because Jesus forgave me. He forgave it all. And I'm not worthy because I made myself worthy. I'm worthy because he made me worthy. And you're worthy this morning because Jesus did an awesome, mighty work at great, great cost in our behalf. And so as we talk about these spiritual gifts, if any condemnation, if anything comes to your mind that says, oh, I'm not good enough, that's not for me, that's for some superstars, that's this or that, you just tell the devil to shut up, that you belong to Jesus, that you are his, you are holy and righteous in his sight, amen? Amen. Okay. So, how many of you were here when Tony preached a few weeks ago? Good, a lot of you are here. And um, you, it was a great message, wasn't it? We laughed, and I wish I was that funny, but I don't think I'm that funny. Um, but Tony told this one story about how he was a very picky eater, and uh, he didn't like to eat anything. And they were at Thanksgiving, you guys remember the story, right? And they were at Thanksgiving... And um, his crazy uncle came for Thanksgiving dinner. And so Tony gets his two things that he likes, a little bit of turkey and, was it cranberry? Cranberry sauce. 
and he puts a little bit of turkey and a little bit of cranberry sauce on his plate, and he's sitting there, and his uncle looks up, and he looks at his plate, and he something to the effect of, that's not going to do, boy. You're missing all this other stuff. And so he gets dressing and peas and corn, and he piles Tony's high, plate high, and then he commits the ultimate sin. He just starts globbing gravy all over the top of everything, puts it in front of Tony, and then says, now, boy, eat. And uh, Tony, in a horrible panic and feeling the whole family tense and wondering what Tony was going to do, decides he's going to try it. And so he took a little tiny bite of the stuffing with gravy on it, and it was delicious. And he loved it, and it completely changed the way that Tony eats. Now, we're going to be talking about spiritual gifts, and that was Tony's metaphor for saying that we're going to be talking about some things that might make us uncomfortable, some things that we're not used to, some things that we're not familiar with, some things we haven't eaten before. And I want to let you know I'm the crazy uncle, and I... I'm going to pile a whole bunch of stuff on your plate. And my hope is that this morning you're going to taste it. And you're going to realize that this stuff is really, really good. Amen? Okay, so let's start with uh, the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. And I think just because of time, I'm going to jump down, go past that to like maybe verse 8-ish. All right, perfect. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given, through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. Now, that wisdom that it's speaking of is a wisdom that comes from God. It's, it's understanding that's not normal. It's not human. It's not natural. The origin of it wasn't the mind. The origin of it was the Spirit of God. To, to one he gives wisdom, to another a message of knowledge. Knowledge, we call it a word of knowledge, and it's where God tells you something about a person or a situation supernaturally. And uh, he might tell you that, that, that someone certain is going to come to church this morning, and I want you to minister to them. Or you might be praying for someone, and he might tell you some things about their background that they were unfamiliar or unwilling to tell you about, and you tell them about it, because God told you. And it's intended to be able to be used to minister to them. So to one, a word of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healings by that one Spirit, and to another, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines." Now, the passages, the, these particular gifts are one of typically what would Bible teachers and scholars consider three different groups of giftings that we find in the Bible. There's one group of giftings called motivational gifts. And motivational gifts are like gifts of mercy and gifts of help and administration and leadership and um, teaching and exhorting. Those are the motivational gifts. There's a second kind of gifts that, that the Bible refers to and people have sort of collected together as a, as a type, and those are gifts of ministry. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, that have been given to the church for building up of the body for the work of the ministry. Now, these particular gifts are referred to as the power gifts. And the reason, obviously, for the power gifts is because these gifts talk about the manifest power of God on the earth. And the thing to understand and about these gifts is that they're supernatural. These things, they're beyond science, they're beyond laboratories, they're beyond uh, human understanding because they exist and they, they come from a spiritual dimension and they manifest themselves in a natural dimension in this flesh and blood world. So let me talk a little bit about the world and the kind of um, a viewpoint that I think has, is hard to hold on to. It's hard for you and me to hold on to because of the, the context that we're living our lives in. But the Bible teaches in Hebrews 11, verse 3, that it's by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared 
by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of that which was visible. So the starting point for everything is, by faith, we understand that everything that you can touch, everything you can smell, everything that your senses can perceive, the planets, the galaxies, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of those things, those were created by the word of God, and they came out of a realm that is invisible, that we can't see with our eyes. Now, the Bible teaches that this world is spiritual, and our five senses can't tap into the spiritual realm. There's a part of us that can, but it's not our five senses. And the Bible says in that realm, that is the realm where God lives. That's the realm also where the Bible teaches that there are angels. And angels dwell in that invisible realm, in that spiritual realm. The Bible said, talked in prophet, prophetically about Jesus God said, I will give my angels charge concerning you to watch over you lest you strike your foot against a stone. But that scripture is also a prophetic scripture about us. That you literally have angels. The Bible says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who would inherit the kingdom of heaven? So how many of you are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Amen. Which means there are literally are ministering angels that God has dispatched in order to minister to you, to protect you, to guard you, to keep you out of trouble and hardships and difficulties. Now, how many of you can say honestly, you've had at least one event in your life that you know you should have died? Okay, almost everybody in this room. And then something strange happened in that event. Am I right? Suddenly you turned around and, there was the, and you jumped out of the way just before the car came or something strange happened. I had a really profound one of these when I was in college. I was a brand new Christian and I was uh, in Arizona and we were climbing into a cave. And the way you got into this cave was there was a, a cleft in a rock and you could slide down a, a sheer rock and then there's probably a foot between you and another sheer rock, and you'd slide down for about 30 or 40 feet and then um, climb a little bit, and then you get into this really super cool cave. And so I spent the day hanging around in this cave and exploring with a friend of mine, but there's another way to get out because that would be a very hard way to get out down this sheer rock. Now, the way that you get out of the cave is there was, basically, if you can picture a, a funnel or a funnel cloud, you know, like a tornado, of ground. So at the bottom of the cave, it was very tight, maybe two or three feet wide. And you'd press your back against one side and your legs against the other side, and you know, you'd push yourself up the cave. But as, as you got higher up the cave, and I would say it was, and I'm, I'm drawing from memory, 30 or 40 feet from the bottom to the top. But as you got higher up, you could no longer press against the wall. You had to climb against one of, you know, up one of the walls. Well, as it got to the top, the opening of the cave probably got maybe 10 feet, 12 feet, maybe from here to that, uh, to that uh, table. And so by the time you're getting to the top, you're actually just climbing up the side of the cave. Well, I'm in, on, on top. A friend of mine, John Carlson, was below me. And I'm almost to the top. The ground is about here. And I put my hand on a cleft of rock and a swarm of flies, it had been 50 flies, came straight into my face. And I freaked out, and I jumped back into the hole. And in midair, my feet land on something solid. I dove back, grabbed the wall, and climbed out. So I'm, I, I look back down to see what I landed on, and there was nothing there. And I asked my friend John Carlson what happened. He said, you ran up the side of the wall. I've never seen any, and we were both just stunned and, you know, the adrenaline's pumping. And later I asked God about that. I said, Lord, what happened? And he said, Dana, my, my angel stuck his hand out. He caught you. I thought, wow, that's really cool. But I believe that we've all had those sorts of experiences because this is a supernatural world. This is a spiritual world that we live in. And we keep getting deceived thinking that all that exists, exists are those things that we can uh, sense with, our, with the five senses we have. Well, the Bible also teaches that there are demons, there are devils. 
and I'm not going to get into an origin, uh, to the origin of those, but they rebelled against God, and they hate us. They are called the enemy of God. The Bible calls, ha, has many names for Satan. I think I jotted down a, a couple of scriptures so that, that you can um, look at. But 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says, calls him a thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy in Ephesians, it talks about, you know, the, the, the armor of God. And it says, be careful, be watchful, be alert, because, um, and, and put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The devil has schemes. And it goes on to say that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So what's flesh and blood? You're flesh and blood, so you're not my problem. Your spouse is flesh and blood, so they're not your problem. Your kids are flesh and blood. They're not your problem. Your boss is flesh and blood. He's not your problem. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, against the principalities, against the spiritual forces of darkness, against the heavenly forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have an adversary who is real, who attacks us, who has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. He wants to keep you from walking with God, knowing God, operating in the things of God. He wants to deceive you. He wants to blind you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to press you down. He wants you walking in guilt and condemnation. And we can't be ignorant that we're in the midst of a spiritual battle. Amen? Now, today we're talking about gifts. And I, I'm going to read it very quickly again. To one is given the Spirit through the Spirit, a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, the thing about these gifts is that God gave them to the church, and He gave them to the church because we need them. He gave them to the church because what part of what distinguishes us from everybody else is that we're living a supernatural life. We have been called, we have been created, we have been redeemed to live a life that is supernatural, not limited by what our senses can perceive, not limited by what our physical abilities are capable of, not limited by what our minds are even capable of because the Bible says that in Christ we have the mind of Christ. So we are capable of infinitely more, and God gave us these gifts, not as merit badges, not because we have earned them, but because we need them. We need them to do the job that God has given us to do. And so as a result, the adversary wants to take them from us. He wants to steal these things, and he's really very accomplished at, at, a, at doing that. So these spiritual gifts have become a, gina, a, a ginormous um, means of division in the body of Christ. How many of you, let me just ask you honestly, how many of you when you hear about these spiritual gifts have emotions like, um, that makes me a little bit nervous? Anybody? How about, um, I kind of feel guilty because I don't really do that stuff? A little insecure? Um, how many of you just plain, plain feel excited? And that's what I want, by the way. That's my goal for today, is that you're going to be excited. But what the enemy wants us to do is, he doesn't want us to open up these gifts. He doesn't want us to learn how they operate. He doesn't want us, so, so what he does is he throws hindrances in our way. He, he tells us that they're dangerous. He shows us people that abuse those gifts he tells us that we have to do something to earn them, to make ourselves worthy of operating in those gifts. He'll go to great lengths to keep you from your birthright, which is to do the works that Jesus did. And so what I wanted to do this morning is I wanted to show you, um, I, I was asked, uh, Hillary emailed me a few weeks ago and invited me to give a testimony of our last event in Africa. 
And I thought instead of taking up Tony's time, I would just build that into this because it perfectly fits with faith, healing, and miracles. So I'm going to show you two things. First, I'm going to show you a little video. And this was a video that Mike Free put together from one of the events that he went through. And Nate Leslie wrote the music, and you're going to like it. Uh, but before she plays this video, um, I want to explain to you a couple of things that you're going to see in this video. It's fast, and it's music, and there's not a, lot of, um, not a lot of talking. But what you're going to see, at one point, you're going to see people literally carrying, squirming people off, the, off of the field. And those are people that began to manifest demons, dropped to the ground, and were experiencing full-fledged demonic episodes. And they were, they'll be carrying them into a tent where they're going to cast out those demons. In another scene, you're going to see a, a big drum that goes up and, you know, that we set on fire. And what that drum is full of juju, it's full of witchcraft items that people have taken off of their bodies or taken out of their homes and put in a drum because they, they listened to a witch doctor, which means they submitted themselves to the demonic. And we've encouraged them to get rid of that junk and we set it on fire and they get set free. And then you're going to see some people giving testimony of their healings. And uh, when you see pictures of people holding their hands on their heads, those are usually people that have so many things, so many sicknesses, they can't just put their hand on their arm or their knee. They, they need lots of God's miracles in their lives. If you see people raising their hands, those are people giving their lives to Jesus. So if, if that's ready, let's roll that. Would you crank the sound a little? I love that stuff. Okay, now would you whip up that PowerPoint? So this is the field, and um, you can see the, the just people hungry, hungry to hear about Jesus. This was in Ngozi, Burundi, and Burundi is considered the hungriest country in the world. And, um, but their, their physical hunger also translated to amazing spiritual hunger. Um, when we gave the altar call the first night, literally every hand, honest to goodness, maybe I didn't see anybody who didn't respond to the gospel. It was just remarkable. So this is a, just a picture of people being prayed for that have sicknesses. And again, 
I ask them to put their hand on what the part of their body needs healing. And if they have more sicknesses than they have hands, just put your hand on your head. And you can see how many hands are on people's heads. And so um, one of the themes in this particular uh, event was God was healing uh, lame people. And one morning I was spending, I was fellowshipping with him, and he said, tonight you're going to see a pile of crutches on the stage. And we did. It was utterly amazing. This boy was born lame, and we were there as he walked his very first few steps. Um, this is just another guy with his crutch. This guy, this guy was really interesting. He had those where you have the two crutches, you know, and t- to walk like that, and he dropped him, walked to the stage, walked up on the stage, gave testimony, and, I, and gave away his crutches. So um, all over the place, you just, suddenly you just see a crutch go up in the air. This was just one of those nights, that's what God was doing. He was, the Bible talks about gifts of healings. And there's different kind, you know, Steve alluded to that this isn't a, the Bible does not give us a comprehensive gift of, uh, a list of the gifts. There's lots of kinds of healings. And in this particular meeting, I think there was a specific anointing for healing lame legs. Um, yeah, that's, that's those guys, um, that guy's crutches I was telling you about. Another old man that, I don't remember what was wrong with his leg, but uh, God healed him. And there were dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. And actually, when we'd ask how many people were healed, thousands of people were healed. But we, we get some of them to come up on the stage. This was a really sweet girl. She had a huge tumor. And um, she got healed the first night, went back to the doctor. They did the MRI or whatever you call it, sonogram or um, what's the baby thing? Uh, ultrasound. And um, she brought the picture of it and the doctor's orders that the tumor was clear. And um, it was just beautiful. Um, this woman could barely see. She was in constant excruciating pain and just instantly Jesus healed her and restored her vision perfectly. Um, this next one is really cool. This little boy, his mother was at our first crusade in Kayonza, Rwanda. And God did amazing things at that crusade. And um, his mother brought him from another country probably took some bus where they put, you know, 60 people in a bus that holds 20 people. And she made it to this crusade believing if she got here, her child would be healed. And this little boy was born lame. And we just stood there as he walked across the stage. It was just, you know, I I can't believe I get to do this stuff. And we get to do this stuff. Um, This lady, this was to me maybe the most touching. I wish you could see her face a little bit better, but... This lady had never had one single night in her entire life where she hadn't woken up with wet sheets. She was completely incontinent. And her, her children and her husband knew, but nobody else knew. She lived in shame. She lived in fear. She, she didn't have the kind of help that we have here in America. And um, she went up on stage and had the courage to tell 50 or 60 or what, I don't know how many thousand people were there this story, and I never saw someone with so much joy because she woke up that morning for the first time in her life with dry sheets. And um, that, that one, that really just, for some reason, that one really touched me. Um, so, the reason I show you those things is because I want to break through this notion that, su- that, that the supernatural passed away when the, when the last apostle died. I want you to under, I want us to get a, an understanding that God is doing this stuff right here, right now, in this day, in this generation. In fact, I think we're seeing an increase of God operating in the supernatural. Now, let me just, let, let me just help you understand something. It would be easy, because I've sat in in the congregation and looked up at the guy in the stage. And it would be easy for you to look at me and think somehow um, I got something special that you didn't get. Or that somehow God has set me apart, but he's not set you apart for that. And I want you to understand that I know me. Tony, you know me. My mom and dad know me. I'm really just another dude. But I said yes to Jesus. 
And I made a decision to believe what the Bible says, regardless of what my experience shows me, and keep on pressing, and keep on trying, and keep on believing the word of God, and, and just take, putting, uh, giving a deaf ear to all the voices that tell me that God doesn't do this anymore, that it's not God's will to heal, that it's not God's will to do miracles. I just don't listen to it. And so the first time I went and did this in Africa, I had never done it before. I mean, just imagine, my first try, I got 30,000 people standing in front of me, and, I, and they're expecting me to minister healing to the sick. And you know what? God did it. Because God is God. Because it isn't about me, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's what Jesus has given to his church. And we need these gifts. Do you know why we have such amazing crowds? I, 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 this, I don't really want to go out on the internet, but, so I won't say the name. There's a big ministry, you've heard of it before. And they do, do events in Africa. And I heard about an event that they did in Rwanda. And they had BMX bikers doing jumps and skateboarders. Doing really cool stuff, you know, things that we would all love to go to. And the first night, they had 75,000 people. Second night, they had about 35,000 people. The third night, they had under 10,000 people. Now, on our events, and I'm not saying this to boast, I, I'm just, I want you to make a point. We usually start out with 35,000 people, and then it grows to really, really big crowds. So what's the difference? They never pray for the sick. And so the BMX bicycles attract them the first time, but once you've seen those guys do those jumps, you know, you don't really want to haul your butt another five hours to get back to watch them do the same thing again. But... When you see the power of God manifested before your very own eyes, when you see your neighbor who couldn't walk get up and give testimony that they can walk, you want to come back and you want to tell your friends because you want to be where Jesus is. And so what I'm saying is that we need this stuff. This is crucial to the job that God has given us to win the world to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity is not a list of rules, of things that we do and we don't do. Christianity is not an improvement project. Christianity is not um, about making you a better person. Now, every other religion in the world, and I actually got my minor in, in world religions, every other religion in the world has the same theme from Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, um, fill in the blank, the Sikhs, even New Age religions. They all have the same thing. The religion is built around doing certain behaviors to make you better. And then, as you get better, receiving the rewards of being better. That's what every religion in the world teaches. It's, a, it's some kind of a modified version of do this and don't do that. Go here and don't go there. And Christianity has nothing to do with that. Christianity takes a completely and utterly different approach. See, Christianity says there's nothing that you can do to make yourself holy. There's nothing you can do to make yourself worthy. There's nothing you can do to live and act like Jesus in this world. There's only one possible way, and that is for, by faith, for us to put our trust in the Son of God, Jesus. And when you did that, the Bible says a, a miracle transpired. A supernatural event occurred. See, you... When, when you submitted yourself to Christ, your spirit, you, you're a three-part being. You're a spirit, a soul, and a body. I'll just give you a real quick ex explanation of that. Your body is obvious. Your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions, your thinking. But your spirit is that eternal part of you. The Bible in Genesis says God breathed his spirit into man and he became a living being. When we sinned, are you still with me? You re really, really tuned in? Okay, when we sinned, the Bible says our spirit died, which means we became, our ability to relate to God died, our ability to fellowship and communion with God died, our eternal life with God ended, 
and we became a spiritually dead being. Christianity is about taking spiritually dead people and bringing them alive together with God, giving us something better than we even had in the first place. And when you submitted yourself to Jesus, this is what happened. Literally, the Holy Spirit, the very same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, came and he joined with your spirit and you became alive. And you became a new creation. And the old things had passed away and all things had become new. And suddenly, now listen, this is, this is where the devil wants to lie to us. He wants to deceive us. He wants us to think that, that somehow this didn't really happen. He wants to remind us of our failings and our, and our weaknesses and our sins and our, the, what we can't do. But when you gave your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit joined with you, the most real part of you was renewed and became holy and as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. Some of you think I'm blaspheming right now. When God looks at you, he sees you through your renewed spirit. He doesn't see you through your behavior. He doesn't see you through your flesh. He relates to you as he relates to his own son, Jesus Christ. He relates to you as a holy, righteous son or daughter of God. That's unbelievable. That's amazing. Now let me ask you, how many of you in this room have given your lives to Jesus? You know it. You belong to him. Here's what I want you to do. Take your hand. I, I don't know if this will work for you, but it works, it, it works for me. Take your hand, put it on your chest, and close your eyes, and I just want you to contemplate right where your hand is. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He's in there right now. The same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that worked and moved in power through Jesus, he's in you right now. And as Jesus Christ is in the world, so are you. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. Oh, amen. What God's heart desire is that we would begin to recognize this amazing thing that he has done in us. This isn't about cleaning up our act. It's all about faith. It's about faith in the Son of God and allowing that King of kings and Lord of lords and his promises to, to begin to ring true in my life. And then step out in faith and do those things that he's called me to do. Now, people often ask me, um, why is it that we see so many miracles in Africa, but we don't see so many miracles, it seems like, here in the United States? And I have a few answers for that, and I'll give you a couple of them. One of them is, is that it says in James that God has granted the, the so-called poor in this world to be rich in faith. And I can tell you that there is something about, th th there seems to be something about being poor that creates a genuine, real pursuit and dependence on God. And it, it appears to me that there's somewhat of an inverse relationship between wealth and faith. And it doesn't have to be, but it tends to be. That as, as, as wealth increases, faith decreases. And as wealth decreases, faith increases. Don't, don't, I'm not setting a theology here. I'm just telling you that seems to frequently be how it is. And we in America have so many of our needs are already easily met that learning how to trust in God is, is um, much more difficult. But the second reason that I would offer to you, and the, the thing that we 
as, a, as the church have to figure out how to overcome is that we, have, we are living in an environment that is utterly contrary to faith. Now, the Bible teaches that everything that we do as a Christian is by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But with faith, nothing will be impossible. The Bible says that we literally, and this wasn't a metaphor. Jesus says, um, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt, but believe what you said will be done, it will be accomplished for you. There is nothing that's impossible by faith. But the kingdom of heaven, the currency of the kingdom of heaven is faith. So anything you want to get from God, you get it by faith. Every single thing that you want that comes, that, that, that is a promise of God, we apprehend it by faith. And, the, and, and what I've discovered, I've found at least four different kinds of levels of faith in the Bible. There's perfect faith, which Abraham, the Bible said, Abraham had perfect faith when he offered up Isaac to be sacrificed. There's great faith. Remember when Jesus was um, going to heal the centurion's servant? And he said, uh, you don't, I'm not worthy for you to come under my, my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed because I too am a man under authority. I say to this one, go and he goes, and this one, come and he comes. You remember that scripture, that passage? And Jesus marveled and he said, nowhere in Israel have I seen such great faith. But then there's also something that Jesus called little faith. So, his, so some people brought a demoniac, a, a man's son, to Jesus, or to, to, Jesus, to Jesus, but he wasn't there. He was off praying, and he brought him to his disciples to cast his demon out, and they couldn't cast the demon out. And later on, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we cast it out? And, and he said in one version, because of the littleness of your faith. So there's perfect faith, there's great faith, there's little faith. And then when Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, he marveled at their unbelief. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ, think about this, God incarnate, the perfect representation of the Father on earth, could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. So unbelief utterly hinders the moving of, of God. And I'm, I would be, um, I'm, I'm searching to understand the distinctions between what's accomplished, what we can accomplish with little faith versus great faith versus perfect faith. But here's what I can tell you for sure. Nothing happens when there's an environment of unbelief. And we have lived, we have grown up in, we have been nursed on a, a philosophy of rationalism and materialism. Rationalism means that there's a rational explanation for everything. And I can tell you, every single person in this room, when you see something that looks strange, you look for the rational explanation. We have, been, we have been weaned on that. That's, that's how our minds are trained to think. And materialism is the belief that, everything, the, that all that exists is material, which means there's nothing beyond the realm of material. So if it can't be found or measured in some kind of a, a laboratory, then it doesn't exist. That's the culture that we've grown up in. That's what's in the air around us when we go to minister healing to the sick, we are frequently ministering in a, an environment of unbelief. And overcoming that unbelief requires a continual renewing of the mind to the truth. Renewing the mind to, to begin to believe what God says in his word instead of believing what my senses tell me, what my eyes tell me, what my experience tells me, what my mind tells me. Now, doesn't this feel awkward? Doesn't it feel awkward to think that I am not actually going to be living according to what I can see and feel and smell and taste and touch. I'm going to live according to this invisible promise in the word of God. But I want you to know that that's the place where the action is. That's the place where transformation really happens. And we can get there. And you can get there if you choose to. And the only real question you have to answer is, do you want to? And I can promise you, it's not that easy. You have to resist what you see, and you have to, you have to um, ignore your own senses, and you have to place the word of God above everything else. And we have, I can tell you, I've been embarrassed many times. I'm scared so often when I pray for the sick. I don't know what what's going to happen. I don't, always, I don't know what to do lots of times. 
I don't know what to tell somebody when I pray for them and they don't get healed. I mean, there's a, there, there's a whole plethora of issues that we have to learn to deal with and learn to become comfortable with. But the thing that we can't do is we can't decide to let our experience replace the Word of God. And we have to let the Word of God become preeminent. And when that happens, I think God sees something in that, and that begins to build our faith. That begins to transform us. So let me just speak a few things that, um, in closing, that I think uh, I want to remind you are true about you. My hope, my, my desire this morning was not so much to, to teach you, but to give you a vision of what's possible. And not only what's possible, but of what God wants us to do. You know, Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. The Bible says in, when Jesus was giving the Great Commission in Mark ch chapter 16, um, if I have it here, I think it might be up there. Yeah, listen to this. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So how is it this, that us ordinary people can do such extraordinary things? Simple answer. It's not us doing it. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit in you, joined in you, operating through you as you are obedient to the word of God. Amen? Am I losing you? I feel like I just, uh, someone just dropped a turd in the punch bowl. <laughs> Has that ever been said in a sermon before? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here's my point. This isn't, this, all of this stuff, and as we go on, as we begin to talk more about these gifts, th this isn't something to make us nervous. It's not something to make us afraid. It's something to be excited about. It's something to realize that you're a supernatural being. You are a spiritual being. There are actually angels that are guarding and protecting you. You are not who you used to be. You know, there's a, one of the most beautiful biblical metaphor, metaphors that I see is a caterpillar. This, this caterpillar crawls along the dirt, crawls in the ground. They move really, really slow. They're easy to step on and squash. But something happens. They, they form this cocoon, and this metamorphosis takes place, and they emerge from that, this butterfly. And that butterfly never again has to crawl along, along the face of the earth. It never again can become a caterpillar. we never mistaken a butterfly for a caterpillar. And you're a butterfly. You have been transformed. You are a new creation. You're a new creation. The old things have passed away, and all things have become new. You have the very mind of Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You are holy and righteous in Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing you can't do. Nothing is impossible for you. You don't all, you, we, we don't all understand all the rules of faith and how things operate in the kingdom, but we're going to learn them. We can figure this stuff out because God wants us to know. He wants to show us. And so what I'm, my prayer is that as you leave today, what's going to stick just clearly in your, in your hearts is that you're, you don't have to be worthy. Jesus considered you worth it. These gifts aren't something to, for you to show off they're tools that you need to do the job that God has given you to do. We, we got to go into all the world. Do you know in India, we had a little tiny crusade. It grew to maybe 1,000 people. And within three weeks of that crusade, there were 15 brand new churches that were started. And nobody in any of these villages where these churches started even went to the crusade. They just heard about the miracles that God had done. And that drew them to Jesus. We need this. This is part of our birthright. This is part of our commissioning. God would never send us out to change the world without giving us the equipment to get it done. And he has given us the equipment. And, and there is no special people. 
We're all special people. God is not a respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for you. And that is a promise from him. And right now, here's what's going on. And this is what excites me about you. Because of what I see when I look in this congregation is I see people that really are hungry for God. Maybe not all the time. I get it. But I see people that are pursuing Jesus, that are not satisfied with the status quo, that want to be world changers. And I believe that that's why you're here. That's why you're a part of this church. That's why you're, you have rapt attention right now. And this is what's going on. Jesus, our king, is assembling an army. And he's equipping that army with his might, with his power, to go out into this world with his message, with his power, with his authority, with his grace, with his presence, with his Holy Spirit, and bring this message to the ends of the earth and transform this world. That's why he came. That's why he's made us. We have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. And he's ready. He wants to equip us. He wants to send us out to do all of the things that Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Now, if that's what you want, just raise your hands like this and say, Amen! Amen. (laughs) Well, Father, I pray. Lord, I thank you for the great and mighty and amazing things that you do. You're such a great God. You left nothing up to us except to say yes. You made us holy and righteous. You've equipped us. Oh, Holy Spirit, you indwell us. And we simply have to obey you and walk it out. And I thank you so much for that, Father. I thank you for this precious congregation, this beautiful church, this beautiful expression of you, Jesus. And I pray that there will be a vision birthed in our hearts of what's possible for us in Christ. And that those lies, those deceptions that tell us that we can't do that, that that's not for us, that we have to earn it, that that stuff would just be crushed, Lord, and under the foot of the cross. Lord, I bless my friends and brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen.